we've been using this word over and over, others, others. And we just rebooted because don't forget, we were told for two years to fear others. Others might have a something that'll kill you. Others might make you sick, right? We were told to stay away from others. We were told to keep your distance from others, right? And, and for two years, we were taught others are bad. And, and we said, no, no, no. Um, we need others, right? And others need you. You need others and others need you. And so um, we were told we don't, we, to be afraid of others. We want to reframe that and start over and reboot. And, and we've been just kind of hitting that theme over and over. Others, others. We exist for others. What we do is for others, right? We need others and others need you. Why should you be in a small group? Because there's people in that small group. Welcome to the Hacker Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Today, I had a dynamic conversation with Sean Stickler where we discussed his life and what ministry looks like pre and post pandemic. He is the pastor of the Pentecostals of Quinty in Ontario, Canada, and has great insight on leadership and church growth. I'm excited for you to hear this conversation. But before we get into that, we just have a short but sweet comment from Mabel Lee on our YouTube channel. This is from the conversation we had with Brother Harold Hoffman, and she says, absolutely love this episode. Thank you for that comment. And for the continued support of the podcast, we are grateful for every review, comment, and share. Now, let's get to the conversation. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Man, it's such an honor to be here and be on the podcast. I only have one regret, Greg, and that is um, that this is not in person. (laughs) Uh, You know, uh, I love Australia, and you all treated us so well. When we were there in Sydney, we had a night on the town together. Mm-hmm. You and your family treated us so well. And then, maybe you don't know, after we left Sydney, we did a drive all the way up the coast, all the oh, way up yes. to Brisbane, stopping in little cities along the way. And it was like the trip of a lifetime. So, you know, unfortunately, technology allows us to do this from Canada and Australia <laughs> simultaneous. But next time, let's get, let's do it in Australia so I can do that drive again. I'm just kidding. Just glad to be here. <laughs> Yeah, man, we'll have to have to do it in person. Get get the proper setup for the cameras. Australia is amazing. That's all. I'm, I'm just giving an endorsement for Australia. <laughs> yeah, I love that drive you mentioned. I love that drive. Uh, just just amazing. going up the coast. Did you go via? You would have gone via Coffs Harbor and all of that, right? I don't know if we, you remember. Yeah, the name. yeah, we went right up the coast there. Stopped in every little city that there was a uh, anything to see, and just stayed in Airbnbs all the way up. And uh, really, it was an amazing trip. Saw whales and you know, every little beach town. It was, it was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. It's a great drive. It really is. Definitely it recommend really it. Is, yeah. And then on the, yeah. uh, if you're leaving from Sydney on the other side of that drive is, is two great cities, Gold Coast and Brisbane. Yeah. So much to do up there, but we went to both. Well, they're amazing. Yeah. Well, it's great to, great to have you on the podcast. Uh, we, we love Canadians over here, Australians. We have an affinity for Canadians. Uh, we feel like, um, you know, I'm American, obviously, but I've lived here long enough that you're messing with me about my accent. So I feel like I've lived here long enough to Yeah, you're, you sound like a true Australian. And <laughs> if we're going to be completely transparent for the listeners, I'm not a true Canadian. I actually grew up in the States. I'm a dual citizen. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up in Delaware. Uh, yep. The listeners will know now know Delaware. Most people didn't know Delaware, the first state. We know Delaware now because it's the home of President Joe Biden. Please don't hold it yes. against me or whatever, <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, so uh, I grew up in Delaware most of my life. So I'm actually a dual citizen. I, I adopted, mm-hmm. you know, became a Canadian citizen. And uh, I have two passports. I'll share whichever one gets me the most advantage in whatever country. Exactly. Yeah, I did the same <laughs> thing. I'm a dual yeah, citizen. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so we're both chameleons just living in another country and identified yeah, I with the country. Yeah, like we're super spies, you know, for the kingdom, right. you know, multiple uh, uh, passports and identities and, you know. Every once in a while, I just pretend like I'm a missionary, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Global right. mission sent me over to Australia. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and the way you do that is uh, you hand out a PIM form whenever you're talking to someone. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. You to stay, right? <laughs> I'm a missionary to Canada. You're a missionary to Australia. So that's right. Just spreading the love. Well, yeah. it's it's awesome having you on. And we, I like to start out these conversations. You mentioned it a little bit there about about where you come from, but getting a, a bit of background about the guests that we have on the show. So, would you mind sharing with us a little bit of your background, where you come from, sure. that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I'm blessed. I uh, 
uh, I have a, a great uh, apostolic and Pentecostal heritage on both sides of my family, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, my dad, he loved to talk scripture. That was our, our dinner table talk, was mostly apologetics and mm. a lot of end time talk and scriptures and what was going on in the world. And uh, I'm thankful for that. Of course, I mentioned I grew up in Delaware and we were part of a great church in Dover uh, under Pastor uh, Wayne Trout. It was a revival church. It was awesome. It gave me my, um, my ideas and my concepts uh, for what Pentecostal church was supposed to be like. And, and uh, I was blessed to be a part of that church. Uh, they had a Bible school there that my yes. wife, who's Canadian, came to Bible school. And, you know, uh, at the end of, actually, she was there the last year before they closed the Bible school. So everybody, you know what happens at the end of a Bible school closing. Everybody's got to get married quick. Right? <laughs> because, uh, and it wasn't quite like that, but it was kind of like that. And uh, some people were getting married and engaged. She actually stayed in Delaware for a few years to pursue her degree. And uh, we got married. And here's the funny thing. And th this is a good lesson for somebody out there. This may be the only lesson they get out of this podcast. But uh, we were engaged and trying to work through all the stuff of life. You know, where are we going to live all this? And, and she kind of was talking about us someday moving to Canada. And we're on a walk, you know, and I don't remember... It was just one of those walks at night, you know, and, and, and I said, Stephanie, listen, I'm telling you, and, and I, I'm telling you, I will never move to Canada. I said, just get that out of your mind. Get that out of your heart. I'm not called there. I will never move to Canada. And she's crying and she's bawling. And can I imagine the Lord's up there just smiling, you know, <laughs> and God's up there just smiling saying, yeah, well, I'll show you. I'll show you. And so now, uh, we've been in Canada. Actually, this month we're celebrating 20 years since we've been in Canada. All my kids are born in That's Canada. Awesome. You know, uh, we've been here a long time. So I learned never say never in the kingdom of God. And, exactly. Uh, and so God did obviously uh, call us to to help her parents in Canada. And of course, the rest is history. There's lots that's happened since then, and uh, the circumstances that led us there. But uh, never say never. The Lord. <laughs> Uh, the Lord knows you don't. So, uh, yeah, but great. yeah, it, it was great. We have a good laugh about that. And uh, now we have, uh, we pastor two churches uh, here and uh, have four kids. And uh, I, I love Canada now. I love Canada. But, uh, you know, I have to apologize to all my Canadian friends that I, that I felt that way, you know, 22 years ago. So, yeah, fair enough. I mean, uh Canada t tends to get a bit of a bad rap in America. You just That's think about true. snow, you know? <laughs> yep. Yeah, that is a fact. And, uh, and, and, you know, when I moved there, all the, my American friends couldn't believe I was moving to Canada. What's wrong with you? Why are you moving to Canada? I mean, I, I, I won't tell you that I had some conversations of this can't be the will of God for your life. You oh know, my I goodness. Conversations. And uh, anyway, Maybe that's a, a topic for another time, but yeah. they, just, they were just kind of, you know, they couldn't believe that someone would leave the United States to move to Canada. The funny thing yeah. is now in Canada, they can't believe somebody would leave Canada to move to the United States. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you probably got some of that moving to Australia, oh, yeah. although uh, Australia is pretty uh, uh, well regarded and, you know, and uh, pretty, uh, they would see that as a pretty good opportunity, so. Yeah, a lot of a lot of Americans have a soft spot for Australia. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's a it's a great place to live. I'm blessed to live here. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so, so you mentioned that you went to Bible school. Uh, I'm sorry, she went to Bible school. You, you attended it as well. I'm assuming. If you want to well, it. no, I did not. Uh, I actually uh, went to University of Delaware, where I got um, a degree in business administration. I've since uh, I ended up going to Urshan Graduate School. And I okay. did get my master's from Ur Urshan Graduate, but um, uh, my my actual first education was there at University of Delaware. And mm -hmm. I tell people, you know what? I mean, uh, there's it's a little bit of a long story, but a lot of the Bible school teachers that were at the the church there, um, they there was a uh, an academy, you know, a high school and elementary school at the church that I was at as well. And so those teachers who were brought into the Bible school were also our Bible teachers in the high oh, school. Okay. And so my Bible school teachers were people like uh, David Norris oh my and uh, <laughs> James Littles. And wow. uh, so what was kind of cool 
is they would maybe lessen the, the how intense it was, but they would use a lot of the same things they were teaching in the Bible school for our Bible classes in the high school. So I, I, I was blessed with some great uh, men and women of God that 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 impacted me in that way. I, I, but I say this, you know, I went to um, secular university and a lot of the things I learned there regarding business and everything from accounting, marketing, management have been crucial in mm. pastoring. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I think it, I, I love Bible school. I'm trying to get my kids to consider, you know, Urshan grad or, or Urshan or whatever, all the Bible schools. Uh, but I do think there is a place certainly for um, getting education uh, that helps you in whatever you're going to do. So um, a lot of those things have been a great benefit to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, that secular education, especially for if, if you're going to be a pastor of a church and, and it, you know, the nuts and bolts, so people don't like to hear it this way, but it's a bit of a business uh, to some yeah. degree. You know, I've been yeah. in, uh, working as an administrator here at the POS for you know 13 years. So a lot mm -hmm. of what I do is not mm -hmm. what you would classify as ministry, but um, yeah. It's very vital to, to but it is ministry grow. and, and yeah, it's it an is. important part of ministry. And, and you mm -hmm. know, you know, there's financial statements involved. There's uh, there's accounting that's needed. Marketing, you marketing, know, we're yeah. all trying to figure out how to properly market our church. And then the management side of it, if you're going to grow a church, you're going to have to know how to manage and motivate people. Mm -hmm. You can learn a lot of that in other ways, and people should. That's why. You know, um, and I'm, and you have guests on here all the time, but reading books of management principles, leadership principles, all those things help us because there is a business aspect. And I'm not that sounds bad, but yeah. there's a reality of there's there's some practical um, business skills that are needed to mm -hmm. pastor and run a church. And you you operate in that you know every single day. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, obviously. You're you're now a pastor. When did you feel the call to preach? You said you grew up in a in a home where you know your dad was a minister, and uh, you guys have been your your family's been in church for a long time. When mm -hmm. did you personally feel that call to ministry to to be a preacher of the gospel? You know, um, my dad uh, never really, or my parents never really, uh, kind of pushed that on me. In fact, uh, for a lot of my life, my dad was in a season where he was not involved in ministry. He had pastored. And when we were there in Dover, it was kind of a transition period. Uh, and he would later again uh, pastor full time uh, later. But there was a season where we were just, you know, good, faithful saints in the church there. And uh, then he got involved there. And so um, he didn't really push that on me. I think uh, I can remember at a North American Youth Congress, and this is what's crazy. Uh, it was a, a NAYC service. Uh, I was a teenager, 16 years old. I don't remember who preached. I don't remember even the city it was in. If I did the math, I could probably figure out what city it was in. But I remember a distinct call in that service. It was one of those services where there was a call to ministry, a call to preach. And I'll never forget my best friend as that call went out. And I was kind of overwhelmed uh, by what was happening in that service saying to me, are you, are you actually, are you going to respond? Like he knew mm. what God was working in my life and, and said, are you going to respond? But it really wasn't even that moment. That was the moment where I know that I said, yes, mm. where I told the Lord, yes, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. Um, I'll go where you want me to go. Even Canada, right. <laughs> uh, where I told him that I, I'll do it. I, where I gave my life to him for whatever he wanted to use it for. But I, I remember beyond that, I don't remember a Paul on the road to Damascus moment where, you know, uh, I heard the voice of the Lord or, you know, an audible voice, anything like that. It was just a sense. It was just a, a tug uh, in my heart every time I went to pray. And, mm -hmm. and as I mentioned, we had a great revival church and we always had an altar call and we always had powerful altar calls. And it was just the tradition of that church. Everybody went up to pray. All the young people went up to pray. And I can remember every service just feeling that that tug, you know, that sense that God wanted to do something special in my life. And people prayed for me. And, and I'm not saying that weirdly. I'm just saying it was just normal to pray for the young people. But I could feel something, just that tug. But it was in that service where I yielded to what, was, yes. what God was trying to do in my life, you know. And uh, so... There was an ongoing 
tug of the Holy Ghost on my life. And, and it was that moment of responding there. Um, and it just every time I prayed, just feeling that, I don't want to say pressure because it's not pressure, but it was just this sense that God wants to do something in your life. Now, now here's the thing. And, and I, I wanted to, to mention this because this is a big question for a lot of people, right? How do I know I'm called? Or I probably even bigger, I hear young guys and they talk to me about this too, even guys in my church. I don't know what God wants me to do. I know I'm called, but I don't know what God wants me to do. And here's the thing. When I was answering that call at that Youth Congress service, in those church services, it was not a specific call. You know, I didn't, I didn't hear a voice saying, you're going to preach the gospel. I didn't, it was a, you know, God didn't give me a vision of a pulpit and a room. And when I got to our auditorium in Belleville, Canada, I, oh, this is it. This is what the Lord showed me when I was 16. I didn't have all that. Okay. I didn't have that. I'm not taking away from those. God does that in people's lives. I just didn't have that type of call. I just loved God. I love God. I love the church. I, I, I loved his kingdom. And I just wanted to be what he called me to be and make a difference in his kingdom. And mm. um, I just started, to be honest with you, Greg, and, and I think this is this is what I tell a lot of young guys now who are trying to figure out what is it God wants me to do? You know, they're looking for, you're going to be in this city at this moment, do this thing. Really, the call of God is just about walking through the doors that God opens up. And that's what I did. I just walked through the doors that God opened up. And, you know, it started as working on my youth team and, you know, just teaching on a Wednesday night once a month. And then my pastor asked me, you know, to to help with teaching Bible studies. And then my pastor asked me to lead worship or take the offering. And that led to, you know, teaching a discipleship class and eventually becoming the youth pastor of our church. And then the door opened up. So my point is this. It was simply just a desire to do something in the kingdom of God. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it would be. I just yeah. walked through the doors that God opened and just kept doing what, what he asked me to do. And, and so mm. um, I, I just say that because sometimes we, we make the call of God real spooky, you know, yes. yep. and, and mysterious. And I don't think it is. I think it's just knowing God's called you and walking through the doors that he then opens up, walking in his mm -hmm. ways, walking in his spirit, and just being faithful. The call yeah. of God is faithfulness to what God asks you to do and opens doors to do. Yeah, that's that's so good. And and even if you've had that road to Damascus experience, you still have to awesome. walk through the open doors, you know? Like yeah. you know, it's amazing that you have that experience, but you you still on the journey, you still have to walk through those open doors. You still have to make yourself available. You have to be faithful. Like just because you have an an amazing call doesn't mean that you're gonna be able to go right into what God Absolutely. wants you to do straight away. And and that's why I love having different people from different backgrounds on the podcast to answer that question. I ask a lot of the guests who come on that question in particular, because like you said, people have made it to where it's a, a bit spooky. You know, it's like, Oh, mm -hmm. unless I have that amazing experience, I don't know if I'm called. And, and this is just a way for me to try and help people see that, Hey, everybody's different. Like for me, it was quite similar to you. You know, there was that tug throughout my life. And then I had that moment where I said yes and said no to other things. And, but for other people, you know, it could be a, a, a light shining from heaven, uh, you know. So, yeah, take away that, that myst mysterious part of the call of God. And it could be argued that every born-again believer has a call of God to serve in the kingdom. And yes. I do believe that. And so, you know, the Lord calls everybody. He didn't call Peter and Paul the same way, you know. He didn't, he, he didn't call Matthew the same way he called Peter, you know. There was the the incident on the boat. And there was the, I'm going to make you fishers of men from, from Matthew. He called him away from the table for Paul. It was the light and the blindness and the voice. And, and so there's room for all of that, but I do believe every born again believer has a part to play in the work of the kingdom. And, and I think that's yes. something we've got to realize. Everybody should be asking, what is it you need me to do, Lord? What is mm. my part? Right? Yeah. And, and, on your journey of answering the call of God, it's led you to, as you said, Canada, Ontario, Canada. You're, you're the pastor of the POQ. Um, can you describe uh, where the POQ is located in Canada? We've had a few on from Ontario area, um, yeah. but just, just so listeners outside of Canada know exactly what we're talking about. So most people would know Toronto, 
right? The, the big city, Toronto. We are east of Toronto, but west of a, of a smaller but a good city, uh, Kingston. We're almost in the middle between Ottawa and Toronto. So we're a city of about 55,000. Uh, it's, it's a great city, you know, small enough where you can kind of be known as a church and not be lost in the massiveness of the mm. city, but, but still a great size city. Um, we actually have uh, a sister city that is, is very close, also about 50,000, called Quinty West. And so that's mm. why we call our church the Pentecostals of Quinty. Uh, we we kind of adapted that, not knowing we were going to, to start a church in Quinty West. But uh, it was just that they call that the Quinty area. Our, our city sit on a, a bay of Lake Ontario called the Bay of Quinty. People come there to yeah. fish and all kinds of water sports and everything. And so uh, our area is called the Quinty area. So our churches are in Belleville and Quinty West. But, yeah. Okay. I was having to look at Google Maps of where you guys are located. You, you're like very close to the lake, right? It's not. We're right on it. Yeah. So that bay is just one of the bays off uh, Lake Ontario, right above Rochester. Actually, yeah, like, wow. if you cross That's the water, just, you're there. Yeah, it's, uh, you kind of get lost in the, the vastness of Canada. My my daughter, she was, she we have these random conversations in, in the car on the way to school every morning. And she's asking me, what's the biggest country in the world? And obviously it's Russia. And mm -hmm. but I looked it up, I think Canada is the second biggest actual country in the world. Off. But if you look at Canada, all the cities are right along the uh, southern border. So, yeah. uh, and there's a reason for that. It gets really cold. <laughs> it's so cold. Yeah. <laughs> in Australia, a lot of our, uh, the vast majority of our population, and I, I guess this is probably why Canadians and Australians really get along. Um, but the vast majority of our population is along the coast because the yeah. interior of the exactly. country is so hard to live there as well. Yeah. And everything that can kill you is there in Australia. Every spider, <laughs> every snake, every, like, I don't know what the Lord was doing there, but <laughs> people yeah. at every dangerous animal there in Australia. Yeah, I joke around with people. It's like, uh, God really didn't want anyone to live in Australia. And like, right, you, exactly. How do you say that? I was like, well, look at all the animals, the fires, the floods, yeah. you know. Yeah, <laughs> that coast is sure nice. <laughs> oh, man, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. So how long have you been pastoring the POQ now? So um, we've been there for 20 years. We came to assist uh, my wife's uh, parents, who at the time were, were beginning to transition out. They've been here now 43 years. We've been oh, here 20 awesome. years in June, and we've been the lead pastors there for 12 years mm -hmm. uh, there. So, yeah, that's kind of, it's, it doesn't sound like a long time, but it is it is now, I guess, two decades. So, yeah. Yeah. And we, we have a mutual friend there, Rob Green. Uh, yeah. We met him at, at Gateway. I have to give him a shout out because if he listens to this and I don't mention it, I, he might get offended. But. Yeah, that's right. And so Rob, uh, actually, again, an American who uh, was actually a young person uh, in our youth group when I was the youth pastor there in Dover. So all his family was there as well. And uh, he's one of those young people that uh, would drive his family, his brothers and him back uh, after youth service, because they lived in the same town that, that I did. So we spent a lot of time together. And it's really the Lord just worked it out that the, the timing was right. And he was able to come with us and help us there and, and does a great job. Does a great yeah, job. that's amazing. I didn't realize that, that you guys went all the way back to, to Delaware. A long together. time. Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. So I, I enjoy following your church online. And that's one of the really cool things about social media is, you know, we, yeah. we meet you guys and then you don't have to leave our lives. You know, you, you, we can follow you on social media, see what you guys are up to and, and stay connected. And, yeah. and I follow your church online, seeing what you guys are doing. And I noticed that you guys have two locations. Now, how long have you had two locations? So we started our, our second location uh, five years ago. Actually, Easter was our first it was our five-year anniversary on Easter. Mm. Our first service was Easter Sunday five years ago. And at that point, we didn't have the building finished and all that, but we had determined we were going to start on Easter. And I'll never forget that, um, you know, we had rushed. Uh, we had a building, and, and, and the building had been donated to us. Uh, I think you've heard me tell that story, how mm. uh, God gave us that building. Our, our purchase and sale agreement was $1 for that building. But... Uh, that building needed more than one dollar of renovations, <laughs> and so we were renovating it and and gutted it and, and did all the stuff. And in trying to get everything ready for a couple of years of renovations and and working on it, I, I really was disturbed because uh, we hadn't been able to do the 
the foundational work to launching a church mm. that I would have liked. And I can remember praying, you know, we were having this service on Easter Sunday, our launch. We did some Facebook stuff and did what we could. But I can remember thinking, Lord, if we did all this and nobody, no visitors show up, right? And uh, just kind of just praying that. And on that Sunday, I'll never forget, I tell these folks, uh, there was a family that showed up. We had, of course, people from the Belleville Church who had come to help us there and get started. And uh, But there was two families that showed up. And one of those families... Uh, had uh there were six of them right wow. so new church that's like huge six that's people huge. right <laughs> and they came with six people and they're still with us today in fact um uh, steve and tressa who, who the family they, they run our, our celebrate recovery ministry now and that's i tell cool. them all the time you know on that first service when you all showed up you were an answer to prayer because mm. you know if, if it was even for just their family it was amazing that day that for whatever reason, they showed up. And uh, of course, there's a lot of people now that have come that we started where that church, you know, we started at a two o'clock and we had people from Belleville go for a couple years. And then we went to a 930 service only because the afternoon was not ideal for guests who are looking to go to church on a Sunday morning. And uh, so we shifted that. And now it's a congregation that's that's really unique. It's It's people that are committed only to that um, yeah, church in Quincy West and uh, people that we would have never met or reached if we hadn't gone to Quinty West. And so it's, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty fun. Uh, has its ups and downs, you know, church planning, but yeah. um, God's been good to us and we're thankful uh, for what he's done there. It's amazing. Yeah. I had uh, Dan McLeod on uh, a couple months ago now, mm -hmm. and he was saying that brother Woodward told him uh, when you, when you're planting a church, you, you, uh, I think it's, it, he talked about, I think it's one year in 10 years. He says, you you won't accomplish as much as you think in one year, but right. across 10 years, you'll accomplish a lot more than, than you would have imagined. And yeah, taking that long view when it comes to church planning, it's, it's difficult, it's especially, yeah, yeah, especially right now, you know, we want, we want results straight away, but mm -hmm. it's a long view. It's the consistency that, that is going to see the, the growth. Well, if we're going to do our job things. right, that it has to be. Right. Because if we're to make disciples, which mm -hmm. is what we're called to do, that doesn't happen quickly. Right? Yeah, that's right. And so sometimes you can get a false sense of success by having a quick crowd. Uh, but, you know, if they're not being discipled, if they're not growing, if they're not getting closer to God, if they're not being born again, you know, that's that's not what the Lord called us to do. He called us to make disciples and discipleship mm -hmm. is a long game, like you said. Right. Mm -hmm. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And what I have found at both locations, you know, we've got a, a good sized church in Belleville and it's, it's, it's challenging because it's a large church and it's very easy in that church to come in on a Sunday and leave and, 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 and just disappear. It's very yep. easy to come into that crowd and not find uh, friendship because there's just so many people that it's hard to make those connections. So we have to be very intentional about helping people to make connections uh, we do that through small groups and, and we're, we're, you know, we try to be very intentional on how can we get people connected in. Uh, in the smaller church, it's a little different. Uh, there you can come in and if you miss next Sunday, we know you weren't there, right? Yeah, exactly. Because we've been obsessing about you being back <laughs> the next Sunday. But both, whether you're in the big church or the smaller church, require time to disciple people. Mm -hmm. And in either context, and it's interesting for me because I get to try to navigate both contexts. I've got a church where it's easy to come and go and nobody and, and just come and, 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 and a bit lost in the crowd. And I've got the smaller church where the, the opposite challenge is there. How do we get these people to buy into what we're trying to do mm -hmm. on the long game? But on both spectrums, it requires time. Just like you said, it requires, it requires patience and, and, and finding ways to create systems that people can become connected, discipled, and really part of um, part of the body, part of the congregation. Yeah. And I think a key to that, and, and we were kind of going to talk about church growth a little bit, but a key to that is people have to feel a part of it, connected, mm -hmm. and involved immediately. And yeah. so at either location, how am I going to get people involved and feel like they're a part of what we're doing? And so that's something we're always asking and strategizing about. And, and again, I've got this weird thing where 
it's different between the two campuses mm-hmm. how to make that happen you know yeah well, we might as well launch into that what what are some things that that you're focusing on again you said that there are two different locations two different uh, uh places along the timeline of church and church yeah. growth but what are some things yeah. that, that you're focusing on you know um and, and right now we've got the third dynamic which is we're coming out of pandemic or i guess we're mm-hmm. out of it but yeah. um you know those two years were very difficult on every leader and every church. Every church had to figure this out, right? Every leader had to figure this out, whether you're a church leader, a government leader, whatever, right? Everybody went through the challenges of the last two years. And so yeah. um, one of the things we focus on is, is small groups, because if the church is larger, how do we become smaller? We have to become smaller to grow. To get larger, right. we have to become smaller, right? Mm. Uh, and so that's one thing we try to do. We're always pushing it uh, at both locations. Now, the other church is a small group. So if you have a barbecue after church, it's a small group, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to be connected there. Uh, So there it's about um, just finding ways to to keep that connection and to make that connection. At the larger church, we're intentional and have systems for everything from pastoral care to, um, you know, um, small groups. Uh, one of the things that we try to do at both locations, this is nothing new, but um, and most people are trying to do this, but is to find a place where people can instantly get involved and mm-hmm. feel part of the mission and involved in the church. Uh, yeah, if they so feel like there's a barrier, like, okay, how long do I have to take to be in this? They're not going to wait around because I, I get share this story. We do a, a thing. A lot of churches do it. Some people don't agree with it. We do it. Uh, we do what we call, um, we've called a number of things. We've called it lunch with the pastor. We've called it next steps. We've called mm-hmm. it growth track. We can't seem to get the right name. It keeps shifting, but it's a <laughs> simply this. It's, yeah. It's just an introduction to our church. Mm-hmm. And what it is, is, is it's just a chance for us to tell them about our church, tell them what we believe and, and um, tell them they can be involved somewhere and then point them in the next direction, which is a discipleship mm-hmm. class. Okay. Right. But even when they're in that discipleship class, we're trying to find somewhere that they can be involved in serving and being mm-hmm. a part of it. I'll never forget this. So we did this one, this, we do this a couple times a year, probably three or four times a year. And um, there was a young lady, uh, her name, it doesn't matter her name. She was sitting in the, in the class there and we went through and I just concluded saying, we want you involved. We want to get you involved. We want you to be a part of what we're doing as a church, reaching our community. And she said, wait a second, pastor. And I said, yes, I was asking her any questions. And she said, so you're saying that I can get involved now? I said, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying we want you involved right now. And this is no word of a lie. We prayed, said, that's good. And she got up from her chair, grabbed the garbage can and the bag and started cleaning up after everyone there in the room, started cleaning up the, the growth track. And uh, the next couple of weeks, immediately, that's what she would do. She said, we're going to evolve. And she just started helping and being a part of that. But for her, that was so important that I can be a part of this right now. Right now. We got her through discipleship, all those different things. She, she was great. She actually moved away to Toronto. And I hate those move aways. But, <laughs> but that revelation that I can be a part of this right now, right? Mm-hmm. We already said discipleship takes time. So if we're going to wait for discipleship, now I'm, I've been in the church a long time. I told you, generations in the church. Discipleship takes a lot longer than it used to. There are not a lot of holy sinners that come to church anymore. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to work through, yeah. a lot of stuff to work through, right? So we have to find a balance between belonging and believing and, and keep both of those things happening. We're teaching, we're learning. And here's what's truth, Greg, is that those times of serving together are actually great opportunities for discipleship. Yes. Great conversations happen, right? Um, Great um, camaraderie and coming together. And those times of serving become amazing points of teaching and discipleship. So I guess what I'm saying is our focus is involvement Mm -hmm. and and fellowship community. Now, this year, and I just want to give you this because this is important. We're on a bit of a reboot like every church, right? Because yes. um, pandemic messed everybody up, right? It messed everybody up. It was tough on churches. It was tough on pastors. 
Uh, we could talk about that later if you want, but it was just very difficult. And so this year we wanted to reboot our focus, refocus again. And so our theme, simple, again, we, we don't have anything revelatory, but we just, we've been using this word over and over, others, others. Mm. And we just rebooted because don't forget, we were told for two years to fear others. Yes, that's right. Others might have a something yeah. that'll kill you. Others might make you sick, right? We were told to stay away from others. We were told to keep your distance from others, right? Mm-hmm. And, and for two years, we were taught others are bad. And, right. and we said, no, no, no. Um, we need others, right? And others need you. You need others and others need you. And so um, we were told we don't, we, to be afraid of others. We want to reframe that and start over and reboot and we've been just kind of hitting that theme over and over. Others, others. We exist for others. What we do is for others, right? We need others and others need you. Why should you be in a small group? Because there's people in that small group. Maybe you don't really have time in your mind to do the, you know, hiking small group. But there's some others in there that you can hang out with, that you can be a part of, that you can have conversations, that need a friend, that needs somebody who's grown up in the church or knows that, you know what I'm saying? So we're yeah. saying we're reframing everything about serving others again. Okay. And, and so that's, that's where we're focused right now. We're doing yeah. in the summer, a couple serve days where it's going to be um, serve others. Um, and that's really, we're just trying to reboot that mission that we as a church exist to serve others. Yeah. That's, that's so good because you, you see that in society as well. Like, as you said, They've been telling us for two years to stay away from others, to fear to others. Distance. Exactly. And you get to the point where you get into this uh, thing where you've got your own little bubble, your own little, was it uh two meter bubble, three meter bu- bubble or whatever. And no one can get close to you. You don't talk to anyone. You sort of exist, go through your life. And, and, you know, that runs counterintuitive to the people who are saying, Hey, church can just go online. You know, I, I can serve God from my house. And it's like, well, right. no, that's, you know, church was never meant to be done alone. Church was meant to be done in community with others, supporting others, helping others. Yep. I, I love that focus. And you can't even, you can't even fulfill the commands uh, without others. Cause Jesus said, right. you know, the greatest command was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like the first to love your neighbor as yourself. So you mm-hmm. have to be loving others in order to fulfill the commands of Christ. You cannot do it without others. Yeah. And like Australia, Canada was really impacted by the pandemic. Obviously, right. uh, the whole world was, but but based on um, the decisions of a lot of our leaders, churches in particular were really impacted in countries like Australia, countries like America. I mean, we went through, I was talking mm-hmm. to uh, Brother Adam Shaw the other, the other day, and we went through four months in 2021, not 2020, 2021, four months where yeah. we couldn't gather and, and right. you guys went through huge stretches like that as yeah. well. Um, and, and obviously, you've mentioned it already. It kind of helped you refocus on some things or some things you had to refocus on based on just what you were allowed to do and what you weren't allowed to do. I mean, they weren't joking in Australia. They weren't joking in Canada. Like, <laughs> you could be arrested. You could be put into right. prison. We had people but, arrested. Yeah, we had pastors arrested Yeah, yeah in Canada. Yeah. So what, what did you learn from this season? And I think you, you've touched on it a little bit, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to actually uh, go into it. And how has it affected your approach to church growth? Um, you know, uh, again, it, the pandemic was tough on everyone. It was especially difficult on churches and pastors and leaders, and that was universal. Uh, and, and what happened in people, you had fear at a crazy level you had rapid change we we talk like we like change most people do not like change and we had so much change happening at such a rapid pace i read somewhere that they were saying that the the trauma that we were going through because of the rapid change was like the the level of trauma that that pow's experienced i don't know whether that's true but that's what i've read uh just because of the the intensity of the fear Mm. and the change and you know um, every day, something new, um, the anxiety and then sickness and losing people. Um, it was a perfect storm of emotions. And, um, you know, it was tough to lead because most churches I know lost people and lost people. Some lost people to the, the virus. A lot of people lost people because of just stuff. 
You know, they, mm. they did they got away from coming to church. Uh, yeah. Like you said, they got accustomed to being online and, you know, it's easier. I don't have to take the kids. I don't have to mess with all that. Uh, but here's what, what really happened. And, and you know this because it was all over. Something in all of that change and, and rapidness and trauma and it, people just got, they were, they were on edge and they were always ready to fight. Mm. They're just ready to fight, you know, and, um, and, and they were easily provoked and easily ready to fight. And, um, you know, I had people mad and just like, I'm sure every pastor, because every pastor I've talked to had the same struggles. I, we were in Canada and you were in Australia and it was similar. And, you know, we had similar context, right? Because our countries kind of handled things very similar. But so I thought, man, it must be so much easier in the U.S. where there weren't the same restrictions. Right. And uh, we were there was people in, in our churches that were mad because some people were taking the vaccine. Some people weren't taking the vaccine. And I thought, man, it must be easier in the U.S. So I went to a conference, I think general conference, and I started talking to people and they were having the exact same problem. <laughs> some of their church were mad and they were mad at people who were taking the vaccine and others were upset that people weren't taking. And so here was the point. The problems were universal. We were all dealing with the same problems. And here was the problem, people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were dealing with humans, right? And humans who were under stress and trauma and fear. And we all were, even the best of us. We might admit we weren't, but there was... The only yeah, difference between the leaders was they walked out into it and did some decisions on principles. And, and, and But we were all trying to survive. We were all just trying to survive, right? And so I had, you know, people who were mad at me that I wasn't taking a political stand. I had somebody else mad at me that they thought I was being too political. Here was the point. If you were a leader, you were being attacked. You were being attacked and there were people that were lost. And I think what the pandemic revealed in those two years is that we as, I was going to say humans, but we as Christians still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. We're still not where we need to be. And we still, it, it, it revealed a lot of areas of inconsistency in our lives. And when I say yeah. inconsistency, I'm saying, I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about areas of emotion and anxiety and fear and things that were unsettled, that what the pandemic did is it brought it all back up to the surface, right? Mm -hmm. And some stuff that we thought we had conquered, we found out we hadn't conquered. And, um, you know, uh, and, and two crazy things happened and you saw it, every church saw it. People who had lived for God their whole lives, some of them walked away. Couldn't yeah. believe it. Walked away from God, walked away from, they weren't coming to church. Some of them, they lived for God their whole life, right? Mm. And then we, and I'm sure you all did too, had people brand new, not afraid to come to church, right? Yeah. Showing up, thinking that I need to get my life right. We had backsliders come back to God and mm. are still like dialed in. And so there was these two extremes that were happening. There was people who you thought would never leave you that were walking away and people you thought would never come back that were back, you know? Mm. Yeah. And it was just this weird thing that was happening. And and it, I found it in every pastor, every church I've talked to, the same type of thing. People that they thought were solid. It was like a shaking to determine what could not be shaken. I mean, that might there might be a scripture there, something about that. <laughs> there might be something out there. We have to search that up a little bit. But here's the thing. This is you'd ask me what I what I learned and what what I'm trying to figure out. Here's what it is. Okay. And it's this. I, I want to focus. This God's been dealing with me. I want to focus on the people who are there. Mm. I'm going to focus on the people that are there. All right. Because I'm a pastor. You work in a church there. You, you understand when someone leaves you, it is devastating. There is yeah. not a condition when somebody walks away or leaves the church that it doesn't hurt. Right. Mm. That it doesn't devastate you. They can move. It hurts. It may not have anything to do with you, but it's still, it's tough, right? Yeah. Um, they can be mad at you. That hurts even more, right? But but it always hurts. And you can get in a cycle as ministry. And I know you have some a lot of ministry and pastors that listen to this. You can get in a cycle where all you think about are the ones who have left. I've had to overcome this because you can get thinking about that. And in the meantime, what about the ones that are there? Yeah. Right. What about the people that are there? And so I can get mad and, and, and discouraged and and be frustrated. But you know what? I've got to focus on who's there. It, it, there's something else at the same time. And I'll tell you where the Lord's dealing with me on this, I'm trying to be kind of transparent without saying too much. But, um, you know, you think about Jesus on the cross. OK. 
and 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 this is an easy illustration, but um, he's going through the most difficult trial of his life. He's on the cross. He's in pain. He's suffering. You know, he's been abused and mocked and made fun of. And you, all, everybody on this podcast knows the gruesomeness of the cross. Okay, and he's standing. He's there on the cross. He's hanging on the cross. And the people who hurt him, you know, the Bible talks about they drove the nails in his hands and feet. And what does he do? He never responds in anger. He never responds in anger, but he prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was able to look beyond the people. He was able to look beyond even what they were doing to him. You say, why did he do that? I think that's because bitterness. You, We cannot as leaders, as people, this is just not just for leaders, as people, we cannot allow bitterness to take root in us. The scriptures are clear that one of the deadliest cancers of the soul is bitterness, right? And so Jesus, as he is hurting, immediately asks for forgiveness for the people that are hurting him. And he refuses to allow that root of bitterness to get into his heart. You see the same thing in Stephen in Acts, right? As they're stoning him, he prays, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Why? Is that about them? No, it's about Stephen. He doesn't want that bitterness, that anger to define him and to be, you know, what, what what's in him, okay? He's hurting. Jesus is hurting. Here's here's what the Lord's been speaking to me about. While he's hurting, he forgives the people right in that moment. He doesn't allow that, that hurt to go with him, and he focuses on the ones that are there. Think about this. What's the next part yeah. of the cross, right? He looks down. He sees his mother, Mary. Yeah. He sees John, right? And what's he do? In his pain, he is concerned about their well-being and their needs, Says to John, this is your mother, take care of her. Says to Mary, this is your son, it's my friend, right? That's his best friend, and take care of her. In his pain, this is what we got to learn to do as leaders. Even in his pain, he is able to look past the ones that have hurt him and look at the ones that are there and be concerned for their needs. That's good stuff. Uh, yeah, listen, no, I'm telling really you, good. here's the thing. Um, he could get focused on who's not there. Peter's not there. Where's Peter? He's hiding out somewhere, betrayed him. Where's Peter? He's not there, right? Where's Judas? He's betrayed him. He, yeah. he, where's No, he's focused on the ones that are there. Here's your mother. Here's your son, right? Uh, and, and I guess what I'm saying is that what God has been dealing with me on is not to get focused on people who have left, but to invest and focus on the ones that are there, right? Train them, invest in them, disciple them. God gave them to you for some pastor that's listening. The ones that are there are there for a reason. God knows you can disciple them or they're part of the ministry of that church. And somebody you may not even th have thought about may be the best minister or help or leader in your church, right? Focus yeah. on the ones that are there. And, and I think that's something that God's been really dealing with me about, trying to refocus that and focus on the ones that are there. Yeah, I love that. It, it's so easy. In, in times like the ones that we've been living in to focus on what it used to be like or who used to be yeah. there or what it was. And, and the reality is, is what it used to be is it's never going to be like that again. You might get to exactly. a stage where it's similar, but yeah. you're not going to get exactly back to where it was. And if we focus so much on, on what it used to be like or who used to be there or the ones that walked away or the, the changes that have been forced upon us, and we don't knuckle down and focus on who's actually there and what's ahead of us. You know, we have to have, we have, to have a vision of the future and, and not look at the past. And I think that was one of the issues that I kind of just dawned on me is one of the issues during the, the whole pandemic is we were living day to day, especially in Canada, especially in Australia. We were living day to day with lockdowns, with decisions that were being made. And we just focused so much on the present that it was difficult to look to the future because you didn't know what, what the future held. And I think it's about time that we move to a space where we are looking at the future. We look at what's ahead of us and, and right. what God can, can do in us and through our churches. It was about survival, right? Mm -hmm. We were just trying to survive. And, yeah. you know, um, the people that are there now are there for a reason. Yeah. And we've got we've to understand this is hard for leaders. This is hard for pastors. It's hard for me. Um, it's his church, it's mm -hmm. his church, right? 
uh, it, it's his church. If, if he, he, it, I heard uh, Brother Mooney say something that really helped me uh, as a young leader. He said it in a setting with, with a bunch of young leaders and he was teaching and somebody asked the question. And the question was, um, how do you create an environment in your home where your kids will be saved in, if you're in ministry? Okay. Mm. This is not where the answer went, but this was the, the genesis of the question. And he was talking about not allowing the hurt uh, from people to, to infiltrate your home. Okay. And he talked about, you know, if stuff was going on in the church and you, you just kind of brush it off and don't make a big deal, don't let them see that you as a leader are being hurt through that, right? Because you don't want your kids to resent the church or right. the ministry or any of those things. Good advice, okay? Yeah. I told you that to tell you this. He ends with this statement and he says, you got to remember, and I'm telling you this has, it, I've, I've talked about this in many places. He said, you've got to remember, and he looked at all of us young ministers and wives and couples, and he said, people are not against you. They're just for themselves. And he said, you got to see that in every person. You got to, when they, when they say things that, that you think hurt you or they, they're doing things, they're not against you. They're just for themselves. It's that, that thing where it's so basic that we're born with, which is that need for self-protection, right? Mm -hmm. And what happened in pandemic is people, they were, they were trying to protect themselves. Everyone was just trying to protect themselves, right? And it wasn't that they were against anyone. They were just, they were in fight mode, right? And I think all of us as leaders have got to, not allow that to have impacted us and let bitterness take root and be the, the lens that we do ministry on from here on out mm. because it was a season. It was a season. It was a difficult season. But what's left, and, and we've done pretty good in, in the Pentecostal world, what's left, God has, God's positioned it and the people that are left, God's given them there because it's his church and he's given them to you as for a great revival and he's going to do it. So you just can't let bitterness get a hold of you. You've got to invest and you've got to be excited, like you said, about the future. And no, mm -hmm. God's got a great future for our churches and for the kingdom of God. Like, he, I believe it. Yeah, yeah, I, too, I do too. And that's such great advice that, that people aren't necessarily against you. They're for themselves. And yeah, we can, it, because we, we look at everything through our, our own eyes, our own point of view. And so if yeah. someone does something against us, we think, oh, they're attacking me yeah. without realizing that they probably, they may not have even thought about you. They're just doing their own thing. They're trying to protect themselves or mm -hmm. they're trying to fix something in there. They're responding to that need for self-preservation, right? That, yeah. that idea. And, and that's something that when we talk about an other's focus in our church, right? We're trying to work that out of us. We're trying, that's natural. It's natural to be selfish. It's natural to be self-focused. And we have to train ourselves to think differently. We have to train our church to think differently. And so we didn't get into this, but you know, one of the questions, and, and, and I know we're, we're getting off topic here, but one of the questions was kind of, what are we doing now? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we did before pandemic that we're trying to reboot is trying to figure out, okay, what is the need in our community right now? that we can meet and we can, and I know you all do that in your church too. How can we make an impact in this city? Uh, what's a need we can meet? So like during the pandemic, we still did this. We, we did a thing where we gave out hand sanitizers and masks and uh, we ended up giving them to businesses and they, they loved us and all that. And, you know, we'll put a sticker on there. And then during uh, one, one season, we did a thing where uh, there was a lot of bus drivers, kids were going back to school and everybody was scared for bus drivers. Bus drivers were complaining because you know, is it safe to be a bus driver during pandemic? And you remember some of this stuff. It was mm -hmm. just questions that were out there. And so what we did is we did something very simple as a church. We put a chocolate bar, you know, a great big Kit Kat or, uh, you know, if you're in Canada, then the coffee crisp or something like that. And we put a little card and a Tim Hortons gift card for a cup of coffee with a little, we care about you. We're praying for you from the Pentecostals of Quinty. And we gave that to every bus driver in the city in, between Trenton and Belleville. And Greg, I'm telling you, you would not believe the calls we got from bus drivers that were overwhelmed, crying. Nobody's ever thought about us. We gave them to crossing guards 
Nobody's ever noticed us. Nobody's ever worried about what our needs were. And all I'm telling you is this, you know, we put our stickers on there. You say, why'd you put your stickers on there for branding? No. I mean, yes, but no, that's not really why. (laughs) Because when I want those people to know there's a church in our city that cares about them, yeah. That loves them. And so when they are in that dark place, when they're in that, when they've got the need, maybe they got the cancer report, where can I find a church that'll care enough to pray? Where can I find a church that will help me? So it's about letting our city know we care, right? And now more than ever, there's still a lot of needs out there. We got a lot of situations. There's a lot of fallout from the last two years that our cities need to know there's a church in your city that cares. And mm. so to maybe some pastors or leaders that are listening, Get a team together and strategize. What's a unique need in our community that we can be the church that ministers to that need, right? And it may be as simple as giving chocolate bars and a gift card for coffee to a group that nobody pays attention to or notices or thinks about that's struggling or fearful. And you can open up a great door of uh, opportunity to care for your city. I heard a preacher say this, uh, probably a podcast somewhere, but he said, if, if your church had to shut its doors, would your city even know you were gone? And that, that haunts me. That bothers me yeah. because I, I want to be a, a church where the city says, we need that church here. We need that church in Belleville. We need that church in, in, in Quinty West because they make a difference. They impact our community. They, they help so many people. And so that's what we're trying to do. And, and again, that selfish self-preservation others, right? We're Mm -hmm. trying to retrain our minds, not to think about ourselves, but to think about others and how we can minister to them. And that's a big task for all of us, but I believe it's the will of God. That's so good. And and that's such great advice and, and easily something that, that people can do, you know, on on a low budget, you know, think of a a need, yeah, yeah, think of a need within your community and, and try and meet that need. And just do the best you can. You know what? Sometimes it seems like it's such a big task and we try to think too big, right? We try to think big stuff that's that's not scalable and accomplished by maybe the amount of people that we have in our church. You start by doing something. Whether maybe you can't do so, you know, with the bus drivers, we did every bus driver and crossing guard in two cities. And but maybe you start with a school, right? Maybe you start with um you know, one bus company. And we even said that as we got the list, we were like, I don't know if we can hit all these bus companies. We said, well, we'll hit the ones we can. We'll just yeah. give as many as we can. And you just do what you can. And, and I, here's what's crazy. That hand sanitizer and um, mask thing that we did, we had truckloads, like U-Haul truckloads of sanitizer and masks that we handed out to our city. And you know how much we paid for it, Greg? Zero. It was totally wow. donated by a company who said, can you distribute this to your community? And, uh, and and we just want to help people. And we said, we can do it. Now, in our city, everybody um, thought the Pentecostals of Quinney, and we were, were helping. Same thing. We had our logo on it. This is for you from the Pentecostals of Quinty. We want them to know we're a church that cares for them. But my point is this. If you'll make the effort to start, God will provide the resources mm. to make it happen. Yeah. But we've just got to take the step and say we're going to do it. And you'll be amazed at the resources that God has that will come yeah. from all kinds of places once they catch wind of what you're trying to do in the community. Yeah, when you have that that focus shift and you start focusing on others, others. where God where God wants you to focus, uh, it's amazing what he, he can release you know, in, into your church, into your ministry. From places and people you would never expect mm. that take notice of it and say, Hey, if you're there doing something, I want to help. It's amazing. It's amazing opportunity that we all have. And it, like you said, it takes very little effort. It just takes a little, just takes a desire to say, we want to make a difference in our community. I love this topic. So let me just say one more thing. I mean, we're way (laughs) off topic of where we're supposed to go, Greg. You know, this is not where we're supposed to go, but I love this topic. And I'll tell you why. This is something that we're beginning to learn in the apostolic church. Okay. We're beginning. A lot of churches are starting to catch on to this. But it is so important and it is apostolic. You say, so somebody listening here might say, what's the need? Well, they need salvation. Yes, we know that. We believe that. They need Acts 238 salvation. Yes. But if you're going to really be a Book of Acts church, the Book of Acts church did what we're saying. And uh, one of the places I love to go, 
uh, is in uh, Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, there's a woman in the book of Acts church. Her name is Dorcas. But thankfully, um, Luke tells us we can call her Tabitha, okay? (laughs) We can call her Tabitha because I don't think, anyway, let's call her Tabitha, okay? And, and, And this is what it says about this woman. I'm just reading to you from Acts 9, 36. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did, okay? And you know the story. She passes away, and this is what's amazing to me. Uh, the Bible says uh, Peter came to her house, right, to see this woman, Tabitha, who's passed away. And uh, when he came, the people are all there. They're crying. They're, they're weeping. They're all upset. And it says, uh, when he had come, they brought him to an upper room. And all the widows stood by him, weeping, showing the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made mm. while she was with them. There's people outside her, her place with clothing she's made for them, Mm. you know, coats she's given to them. And and you know the story, Peter knelt down and prayed and said, Tabitha, arise, and she opened her eyes, and and she sat up. And here's the thing. This lady was making such a difference in her community that the Lord brought her back. There aren't too many people that got brought back to life in Scripture. There's a few, right? And I think the reason for that is is there's a better life on the other side if you're Mm. a believer, right? If you're born again, there's a better life over there. But every once in a while, the Lord says, you know, no, I got to bring you back, Lazarus. I got to bring you back. He had to bring her back because of the charitable work she does. People are being impacted because this woman's charitable deeds. The, the yeah. first church had to add more staff into the church, right? In, in, um, in the book of Acts, the first time they said, we got to get some more staff is why? Because they were giving food to widows, right? Distributing food. And they said, we got to get some more staff because our needs, what were our ministry is greater than our staff. Here's my point. The early church tried to meet the needs of people and help people and focus on others. And I believe it's a crucial aspect to growing a church, having revival, and keeping people not becoming Mm self-focused and and keeping their minds and hearts on others. And when you do that, you will get opportunities to talk about baptism. You will get opportunities Mm -hmm. to get them involved in church. And here's the thing. Even if you don't, you still did something good. Jesus said, you don't even give a cup of water in my name that I don't keep record of it. So yeah. uh, I love talking about that because it's something as a church that we are passionate about. Mm. Pandemic hurt us a little bit and we're starting to get back in that flow. But I believe it's crucial to revival in these last days. Yeah, I agree. And and even if we try to use the excuses like, you know, it's the last days and, and we have limited time, we have limited resources. So we need to focus on getting people born again as opposed to these other aspects of ministry that we can do. Um, you know, as you said, they kind of go together. Number one, it doesn't have to be but number either two. Or. Yeah, right. exactly. Exactly. It's but number two, or. it's all even together. In the, yeah. And, and even in the new Testament church, they believe Jesus was coming back as well. It's not Man. like, right. <laughs> you know, and they were still right. doing it. So obviously they actually believe he could come back any day. Exactly. Yeah. Which we believe and, also. Right. Exactly. And and they were still investing in it and they were still made sure that yep. it was a priority within what they were doing. Yeah. So good. Well, Amen. this has been a, a, a awesome conversation. Really enjoyed my time with you. I like to ask this question to everyone who comes on the podcast. So I don't want to skip it before we finish up, but what drives you when it comes to ministry? What is it that is that driving force for uh, brother stickler when it comes to ministry? You know what? Um, Really, I understand and and I believe God has been so good to me and blessed me. And I'm not just saying that about Sean Stickler, but I believe all of us. God has been so good to us. And I'm really motivated. And this, I I just want to hear him say, well done, that I did Mm -hmm. my part, that I fulfilled the role that he had for me, what he wanted me to do. I don't want to waste the time and opportunity. What really motivates me right now is, you know, James said, um, life is just like a vapor. Uh, it's here for a little while and vanishes away. And of course, the older you get, the more you realize how true that is. And um, life is measured in minutes and seconds. And I want to make the most of those minutes and seconds in this life. And I don't want to miss out. I don't want to live with regrets. I don't want to say, I wish I had done that. I wish I had. I just want to, I want to be what he's called me to be and uh, hear him say, well done and and be what he wanted me to be and do what he wanted me to do. And I do believe, and I tell my kids this, and I tell people this, if you'll do that, if you'll just um, 
continually surrender and walk through the doors God has for you, it's pretty amazing stuff that God will will involve you in. Kingdom work is amazing, and it's it is yeah. it's amazing the the areas and the places and the opportunities God will lead you in if you just continually resurrender. Lord, I want to be what you want me to be. I want to do what you want me to do. And, and he'll lead us into some amazing experiences. There's nothing yeah. like it. There's nothing like living for God. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you for your time today. I like to finish up all these conversations with uh, our guest with a, a word to the listeners, something that God has laid in your heart specifically for the podcast. I know you've gone into a, a, a little bit here and there, um, but something you know specific for the listeners of the show. And thanks again for your time today, setting aside to be with us. Thanks, Greg. I've been, it's been an honor to be on and I'm sorry conversation didn't go kind of how we thought it might, but the Lord knows. And, um, and, and this is a scripture that the Lord's been uh, dealing with me about and, and just kind of keeps reverberating in my mind. In Ecclesiastes 3.1, uh, it says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill. And this is the part that's been kind of, I've been dwelling on and meditating on. He said, and a time to heal, a time to heal. And we're in the place and, and in our conversation, we got off into this. So I, I really feel like this is the will of the Lord that I conclude with this. We're in the place where things are beginning to finally feel normal again. I was at an event the other day in Toronto uh, where there was, it was packed full of people. Uh, and I thought to myself, it finally feels normal again. I know there's still a lot of challenges in the world, but it, it just felt normal. It felt as normal as I'd felt for a long time. And still, even though things are beginning to feel normal again, we just came through two years where so many leaders were fighting for our, our survival. We talked about that. Fighting for the survival of the church, fighting to keep churches open, fighting to to um, against a spirit of fear, fighting against anxiety in people, fighting to get people to church, right? Uh, to fighting, defending decisions and feeling the attack and having to defend kind of decisions and, and those type of things. And people fought with their friends and neighbors, relationships that were severed, right? Divorce rates skyrocketed through pandemic and relationships that were uh, abolished and severed and just fighting, fighting, fighting. I told you, people just were ready to fight. So many relationships impacted through those two years of pandemic. And this is what the Lord's been, been speaking to me about. He said, it's time to heal. It's time to heal. It's time to heal and be the church and have revival. And so my word, my final word is to whoever's listening and whatever relationship you're still hurting over and whatever... Um, situation, you're still, it still kind of stings a little bit, right? It's still, you still toss and turn about it a little bit. There's still a little bit of hurt. The word is don't let bitterness or anger or resentment become the place that you operate from. Do certainly do not allow it to become the place that you minister from. Don't let it infiltrate your preaching, your teaching, your praying with people, your connecting with people. Don't let it become the lens that you see all people through. I'm telling you, it's a terrible cancer that the scripture warns us against. It's time to heal. It's time to heal. And um, it can't be the source of our decisions, our sermons. What we've been through is a reminder that we still have a long way to go and that humanity needs Jesus. It needs the church and it needs you. It needs the church and it needs you. And it's time to heal and be the church and to be the people of God that he needs in this hour. God brought us through so that you can show forth and maybe preach and certainly demonstrate, but definitely offer healing to this broken world. So if you'll let me, let me pray for whoever's listening. I felt that for somebody, Greg, and so I want to pray that somebody will be able to release that and hopefully something we've said has been enough to, to reveal something in their life, a hurt, a bitterness that's still there. I'm going to pray for God to bring somebody to a place of healing and uh, realize 
the people need need us right now. They need the church. So let's pray. Lord, we love you and thank you. Lord, you know who will listen to this podcast and the unique scenarios that will be ministered to through a conversation that we had here tonight. I know, Lord, many still feel the sting of a relationship that was broken during COVID. I know there's some ministers maybe still feel the pain of someone who walked away or hurt them or said something about them. I know there's family members who were separated and brother was against brother and there were so many political agendas and so much division, but now, Lord, it's time that we heal. And I pray that there would be healing in the lives of someone and and people that are listening right now. Specifically, Lord, there's someone that's going to lay it at your feet. We're going to come to the foot of the cross today because there is a Savior who's hurting, who's been betrayed, who's been mocked. There's a Savior who's hanging in agony. He's hurting himself, and yet his focus is only on others, and he His words are only words of grace and mercy and love. Let us be like that, Lord. Let us be like you. Let us be like you. This is an opportunity, not only to heal, but to be like Christ. And so we want to be more like you in the way we talk to people, in the way we respond, in the way that we deal with people and relationships. Help us, Lord, to honor you, to show you, and to be agents of reconciliation and healing in this world. In Jesus' name.